Hi everyone, Raif Darazi here. Today, I welcome back Jeff Galvin, the CEO and founder of American Gene Technologies. If you've been following some of the HIV cure research news, you may have heard of the AGT-103T clinical trials for an HIV cure um, that American Gene Technologies have been running and the hopeful results that we talked about here on this channel last year. If you've yet to see those videos and interviews, um, check them out. I'll put cards up here so you can watch those. And Jeff Galvin today has an ask for us. I'll have info down below if you want to jump quick to that. And there's info and links down in the description box. Otherwise, join us along for this interview. Before we get to the ask, Jeff, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you, uh, Raif. I'm, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on your show again. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I understand you have an update for us regarding the clinical trials. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, the we published... Uh, three articles at this point, one before we got into the clinical trials and two since then. And I'll send you the link so you can put them in to the description. Um, but um, we published the phase one uh, data and we've submitted that to the FDA. And I'll tell you in a moment how that went. And then we followed it with an analytic treatment interruption where we took people off of their antiretrovirals to see how well these cells that we put into their body, these modified cells, uh, could uh, suppress the virus. And we got some really remarkable, exciting data on all of this. We're not all the way to the functional cure yet, but I think that this was uh, quite encouraging that uh, we have line of sight to that and also that we've achieved something that probably has significant value in enhancing treatment of HIV. So uh, let me start with the uh, phase one results. So we managed to enroll seven participants into the study. And all seven participants, of course, are living with HIV because that's the nature of gene and cell therapy. They don't allow you to test it on people that couldn't derive theoretically at least some benefit. So you uh, actually get people that are living with HIV into the study. And uh, then we went ahead and we were um, doing a trial to establish both safety and something called blood markers of efficacy of these modified cells. So the idea, you know, for some, some of your viewers may not remember all the details on this, but what we're doing is we, we do a 300 milliliter leukopack from a, uh, somebody living with HIV who is well controlled on antiretrovirals. And we find HIV specific CD4 positive T cells that are supposed to create an immune reaction. Of course, they don't work because HIV can just infect them and uh, deplete them. And then they never do the work of uh, signaling to the CD8s and the B cells to fight the virus. Um, so, but what we can do is we can protect them from HIV infection. So we find them and in an automated cell process that takes about 11 days, um, we will stimulate them to increase the number of them. Then we deplete out the non HIV T cells. Then we modify them with a lentiviral vector that should make them impermeable to HIV. So now you have CD4 cells that are special, you know, think of them as super cells. They can survive the HIV attack and then they can stay in place and direct the CD8 and B cell response, just like a response to any virus. So that's what we were doing. And in the phase one study, we need to establish safety and what are called blood markers of efficacy. And the blood markers of efficacy is we want to see that the cells get in there and that they persist in the body and that they're durable. So that's called engraftment, persistence, and durability. Durability means that they keep their function. Okay, so how do we do in the phase one? 100% on both endpoints, okay? Zero serious adverse events. That is the most important thing in a phase one is you wanna show that you're uh, not causing uh, pain, you're not causing problems. And, and that matched the theory because we're not changing the behavior of these cells, we're only making them uninfectable. So they should be like any other immune cell in the body, unless they see the virus, in which case they will amp up and start fighting it, right? So uh, sure enough, we kept people on antiretrovirals and we saw that they engrafted, they found a home in the body, uh, they persisted. So even after 180 days, there were plenty of these cells left and that when we looked at them, they were still stimulated by HIV. So they reacted to HIV. So 100% uh, on all of the endpoints of the phase one and we wrote an article and published that in Frontiers in Medicine. So we've submitted that data to the FDA and they reviewed it. They asked a few questions and we answered those questions and there wasn't any, you know, sort of leftover issues as far as we could tell. And then they went silent, which is sort of their way of tacitly accepting 
the data and that signals to us that we can start thinking about the next clinical study. Do you mind if I ask how long the clinical trial was? Oh, the entire trial? Uh, so we started it in 2020 and wrapped it up in um, the end of 2021 and submitted the data in 2022. You know, the next thing to do is a larger study, right? But there was also some information that we could gather from those participants if they were willing to continue because we had never tried taking them off of antiretrovirals and seeing if these cells had an impact in their body. And uh, even though- Which is a big had, deal. This is a big deal, yeah. We had been uh, you know, waiting uh, to try an antiretroviral withdrawal for somewhere between 100 days and 490 days, if you can believe that. So during that time, the number of cells uh, goes down. This is normal. When you have extra cells that aren't being used in your immune system, your immune system will eliminate them because if you kept all of them from your childhood and your teens, you'd be double your weight by age 20. So your body's really good at eliminating the cells once they're not in use. And when you're on the viral suppressive medicine, right, the, the antiretrovirals, then these cells are not actually stimulated by virus because the virus is being blocked by the antiretrovirals. So, you know, they were at much lower quantities after 100 days or 150 days or 400 or 490 days was the longest amount of time. But we thought if these cells have are in there, we should see some reaction to the virus if we allow it out of the viral reservoir by withdrawing the antiretrovirals. Okay, and, and what would you expect? When somebody goes off their antiretrovirals, the virus comes out of the, the, the uh, uh, viral reservoir and starts to fill the bloodstream, starts attacking CD4 cells, and you see the CD4 count go down. Everybody remembers that from the 80s. This is how everybody tracked their situation is their CD4 count. The longer HIV is allowed to circulate in the body, the lower the CD4 count goes down. Okay, so that's what you expect to see is a depletion of CD4. What don't you expect to see? Well, the virus will go up, but you don't expect to see the CD8s react to it because the CD4s that are being depleted are responsible for helping the CD8s to react. So without that helper function, even if the, vir the viremia goes up, the CD8s don't go up with it, okay? So, out of the seven participants, six of them agreed to go off of their antiretrovirals. And what we saw in all six of them was the exact opposite of that, of what I just told you. The CD4s remained stable. So it looked like they were surviving the attack. And the CD8s reacted to the viremia. So in 100% of the participants, we got what you would consider an uh, effective immune response. It was behaving the way it should. Okay, now remember, it's a very small number of cells uh, after that time. And another thing to remember is that the cells are naive. You know how when you get the flu and you haven't had a flu shot, your cells are not prepared for the flu. So when it gets into your body, the flu will actually expand to huge levels, 50 million particles per ml of blood uh, before the immune system gets on top of it and drives it down. And that's because it's sort of like the virus gets to start the race and then the immune cells realize that the race has started and they have to catch up, right? By then, you know, the virus has gotten way ahead, but the immune system is amazing and it can catch up. So, um, you know, the, the viral levels went up to almost, a, you know, what you would expect a normal uh, peak level would be after a withdrawal experiment. Uh, and uh, so we put them back on antiretrovirals and we brought all the participants back down to well-controlled. So... Uh, what you consider undetectable, somewhere below 50 particles per ml or below 20 particles per ml. And we asked them, how, uh, which of you would be willing to take a second withdrawal? Because now that these cells have seen the virus, they're no longer naive. They're activated and they're in effector state, almost as if you've been vaccinated as well. The perfect vaccine for any virus is the virus itself, right? And since we can put people back on antiretrovirals, we know the virus can be controlled. Right. So if we need to control them, we just put them back on antiretrovirals. So that actually serves as what we call an auto vaccination. And after the vaccination, these cells should be able to react better. So what did we see in the four people that came off their antiretrovirals a second time? A hundred percent got a much better reaction. What we see is that the immune cells amp up much faster and react to the viremia faster. And 
the viral loads that they ended up at were um, a, more than a log lower than their initial peak. Okay, a log is a factor of 10. So in one patient, they had a 40x reduction in viremia. And instead of doing what these things, what the, the viral uh, load normally does, which is it'll go way up and then it'll come down and settle at what's called um, a set point. And set points can be somewhere between, you know, 50,000 on the low side is kind of a normal range up to maybe 250,000 or even 500,000 uh, in worst cases, right? Well, uh, what we had, all four participants had lower than a 25,000 particle per ml uh, set point, all right? Now, um, two of them had set points that were in the range of five to 10 thousand. Now, why am I all excited about that? Well, at that level, if they could maintain that forever, right, if their immune system would keep the uh, viral loads below 10,000, approximately, um, the uh, common wisdom is they no longer need antiretrovirals to prevent AIDS. Now, they're still contagious. So we haven't achieved functional cure in that experiment. But that's a significant level to bring them down. And two out of four, we're at that level. So I'm excited. I think that we've got really good data. Now it's a small data set, but we just keep getting these 100%, right? 100% safety, 100% blood markers of efficacy, 100% um, uh, a, an effective immune response, and 100% additional viral suppression from this auto vaccination step. And half of the participants are at long-term non-progressor level. The normal uh, number of long-term non-progressors that you find out in the population is 0.5%. So you can't conclude anything from only two participants that hit long-term non-progressor or even four that are down below 25,000 particles per ml. But you got to call us either the luckiest company on earth or something's going on here. All right. And that's the important thing. We need to get into the next study and we need to put statistical power around the observations we've made already. And if we do that, we might be able to define uh, what are called pivotal endpoints for a phase two study. And uh, that might mean that we could be on the way to getting permission from the FDA to actually bring this out uh, to the public. Now, all that stuff is speculative. You know, there, there's no guarantees about what comes next. But I know what we want to do. What we want to do is what's called the phase 1B. So we can use the same IND. We give a small protocol change. And what are we going to do? Instead of waiting, you know, up to 490 days for taking them off their antiretrovirals, we'll take them off right away. Will you get more a better reaction with a billion cells instead of a small fraction of that? Seems reasonable right? Because that's the number of cells that we put in initially. It's about 10 times the level that people have after clearing a viral pathogen. So with that many CD4s in there that are protected from HIV, we'll see. Maybe we'll get better suppression uh, initially. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to do a short auto vaccination. It'll always be eight weeks and we won't let them get up above a viral load of 20,000 particles because that's all you need in order to get the cells uh, educated, so to speak, you know, in activated effector state. And then we'll wait exactly 28 days before we do the second withdrawal, because that is what uh, is a normal protocol in a vaccine study. In other words, once you have activated the cells, you let them rest for 28 days and they're in the best shape possible for the second attack. All right. So that will be the phase 1B, and I'm just telling you sort of rough parameters of this, but we're expecting to do 24 patients, and um, we've already got trial sites all, you know, uh, lining up to do this study. We're lining up the manufacturing, and I'm just very excited to move forward into something that will progress the data uh, and possibly, remember, you know, it is conceivable that at this billion cell level, we might see functional cure. The only difference between what we saw, this viral suppression and functional cure was a log or two, all right? We've already come down a log of, or two. So if we have a, you know, many, many times the number of cells, could we bridge that last level? And um, I'm hopeful uh, that we can do that, but we must do the study. 
And that's where we are right now. And when you say functional cure, you're referring to the viral suppression. So for myself, for example, I would still have a latent reservoir with HIV in my body, but it would be having no impact on my body. It wouldn't be replicating and I would have full viral suppression off medication. That's correct. Yeah. Functional okay. in medicine means equivalent to. Okay. So what it would mean is that if there was HIV left in the body, it would have no impact. So you can't be contagious. You can't get AIDS. You don't need any other medicine because, you know, you've got to be equivalent to cured. And the cool thing is, is that if you're part of a vulnerable population where there is still HIV traveling around, you can't get it again because What's a tiny little dose of HIV when your immune system's capable of suppressing your viral reservoir? There's been an article recently that uh, has uh, speculated that an immunoregulatory approach to suppressing uh, the virus this way could eventually lead to even a sterilizing cure where the CD8s might eliminate the viral reservoir. So, you know, you don't know what will happen long term, but the important thing would be to live free of having to think about HIV. That's my dream, you know, for this community is to just go from, you know, taking a pill every day or, or taking an injection every couple of months to never thinking about it again. Never thinking about, oh, do I tell, you know, um, my status to somebody, you know, things like that. I mean, just things that everybody takes for granted. And uh, that some people that are living with this intractable disease, you know, just battle, have to battle with every day. Uh, some, you know, some people are, are handling it really well. And I always try to encourage people to, you know, just stay on the antiretroviral meds and have a great life. I mean, you're a great example of that. I just love what you're doing with, uh, you know, all the stuff that, that, uh, you know, you're involved in. And I just, I think you're, um, you're, you're an inspiration, uh, you know. I don't have HIV myself, but I got to say, I have problems in life like everybody else does, but you're an inspiration to me that you don't let a challenge get in the way of having a great life. And I think that's how everybody should be, but then we should take it one more step and we should get something so that you no longer have that burden at all, that thought, okay? You can go on to whatever that's the right. next problem is in life, right? Yep. <laughs> Live for today, be in the moment, enjoy life, but also have your eye on the ball on improving things if 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 there's the potential for that. Um, yeah. I know so many people are going to be, I mean, this is super fascinating, exciting, very hopeful. Um, it's really interesting to hear on a personal level. You know, I've been working a lot with HIV cure research um, since we last spoke. So I'm starting to understand more and more. And I hope my audience is too, as I'm hopefully translating it for them. Um, so yeah, I'm, and I'm sure that people are really inspired by the progress that you've made. Um, with that being said, um, I would love to hear what your ask is for us today. Well, um, my ask is, is that people that are listening to your podcast, people that are living with HIV, people who care about folks that are living with HIV, think about supporting our project and donating to it. One of the issues that I have found is that it really takes people who care about stuff to get things done. And I've been in this now for 17 years and I've been working on HIV for over 10. And one of the things that I've seen is that it developing a drug is a arduous, expensive process. And I have raised $90 million so far from people who care, uh, but also people who invested because they felt like uh, this might make a return as well. And now we have this new clinical trial. It's going to take another $20 million in order to complete the next study. And there's been a really down year in biotech 2023. We survived. We even thrived. We got the, another article out on the analytic treatment interruption study, which will, you know, I'm sure you'll have in the comments there. Um, so I think we did well, uh, but at this point, um, we have been involved in trying to uh, get money from institutional investors 
through what's called a special purpose acquisition corporation. It's very technical, but it's a way to get a public listing and to bring institutional investors in. And I got to say, it has not uh, really been a success. Um, the, is, that, uh, is that the vehicle that you were going to use to be able to IPO? Exactly, exactly. Okay. And what's happened is, is it's very expensive to do the work in order to file with the SEC to do the SPAC you know, the, the, this type of SPAC listing. Um, and we were led to believe that we would be receiving, you know, tens of millions of dollars over this last year to help drive the development at the same time as we were doing the work to de SPAC. And that did not come through. And I will, you know, I will, uh, without saying any specifics about it, because, you know, I'm not looking at laying blame, but I would say that. Wall Street right now is uh, not prepared and not supportive of something like this. They're looking at easier uh, ways to make money. And so, you know, this is going to take some persistence, right? Some patience, some persistence and, and passion. Okay, we got the passion. And um, but I don't see a ton of Wall Street support. Now, we also are going out to pharma companies and we're starting to get a little bit of, of uh, traction there. And I think part of that is because there is some uh, interest in the kind of viral suppression that we're showing because it could improve HIV treatments, which I think would be much more compatible with the pharmaceutical model of treatment right now. Um, you know, if, one, if, if a company could make a lower dose antiretroviral with less side effects that lasted longer, that would be more competitive in what is a $35 billion treatment market, right? Now, so that gives them an incentive to say, hmm, if this technology can help us to be competitive, that makes sense. Um, on the other hand, I'm not so sure that they believe in or are that motivated in potentially curing it because um, their, their business models aren't really uh, designed for things that, you know, get where the, where the, uh, population of the people that consume that product are going down, right? Well, here's a good question because as I have, have continued to talk about HIV cure, the pushback that I get from community is big pharma is not interested. They don't, they're not only are they not interested, they're going to suppress the potential for a cure. How yeah. do you convince big pharma quote unquote um, to, to hop on to something like this? What is the incentive for them? Well, the incentive is money. I mean, they're public corporations. There's only one reason for them to cure HIV, and that is because of how lucrative it is. And you're like, well, wait a minute. You just told me on one hand, you know, the, the number of, of people that need the drug will go down, and that means lower revenues. But yeah, you know how many people have HIV? 39 million people on earth, and 5 million of them are in the U.S. and Europe and could actually afford a cell therapy. A cell therapy would actually earn the pharma companies more money than the lifetime expectation of those daily or monthly or whatever medications right now. And so where's the extra money come from? The side effects, right? If people that have HIV are naturally suppressing it, then they're not having liver, kidney, heart disease, and extra cancers. If they're not having those, they're not having the expensive uh, treatments that, uh, that they need to fix those problems. And that means that the payer's cost is lowered right? The average cost of an HIV, uh, of a person living with HIV in the United States is $1.7 million in direct healthcare costs, going to doctors to have liver panels and the medications and this, and this treating the side effects and then the long-term side effects, you know, so they're looking at 1.7 million. Well, you know, what's an, an average cell therapy about a million. So we could pretty much cut the direct costs in half Would the payers like that. Sure. But if you look at what say, uh, the, the treatment company gets, they're only getting about 600,000 of that. Wouldn't they rather have a million? And wouldn't they rather have a million today instead of in small payments over the next 30 years? And they wouldn't run out of patients for 30 years, right? Okay, and then I just say, hey, cure something else, right? Gene and cell therapy is gonna give us opportunities to cure so many things. Pharma companies are like, a big pharma company would be $200 billion company. You know how big Apple is? Three trillion. That's because when the Mac came out, they didn't go, okay, people are addicted to it. Now let's just raise the price every year until it goes off patent. 
right? I, I like to say that if uh, Microsoft was a drug company, Excel would cost $24,000 a year. Okay. But the point is, is in software, when you open up an opportunity like that, there's many ways to do things in software. It's a cottage industry. So comp competition comes in. So that's what keeps Apple and Microsoft honest, right? Putting out value in return for what they get, right? And not, you know, they, they can't extract, uh, you know, from their uh, consumers because if they extract too much, okay, you'll use Google Docs instead or Linux, right? And so there's a limit on it, but how do they still grow? They put out new value. That's what drug companies in the future will do. You know, some drug company is going to go ahead and cure HIV. I think that, you know, it, here's another Steve Jobs quote, because I was back at Apple for quite a long time. So I have a lot of Steve Jobs stories. But one of the things that he said is uh, they'll know they want it when I show it to them. And that sort of answers your question. Like, how are you going to get the drug companies to do it? Well, I'm going to show it to them. And once we show it to them, they'll do it. So, and then we can explain the economics of it. And I think that, you know, would one of these treatment companies like to be a $600 billion company instead of a $200 billion company? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And that's exactly what they can achieve because they can double or triple their revenue and they're never going to run out of people that want to be cured because there's 5 million of them out there times a million dollars. That's a $5 trillion market eventually. Okay. So the first one in there is really going to do well. So I think that they'll take it if we show it to them, but will they, you know, will they work on making it happen? Maybe not, you know, maybe they're not that motivated to potentially obsolete, you know, a $35 billion profitable market. You can understand that they're, you know, they're shareholder corporations. Now we, on the other hand, uh, we can only be successful. We can only make money for our shareholders if we produce something new. So we certainly have all the right incentives here. So we're going to keep driving for this. And again, this is why I'm asking for help from the community, because I think that there's very little light between us. Right. You know, we both want the same thing. Folks at home, not to belabor all the money. And, and this can be a little feel a little cold as someone living with HIV or, or, or you know, having experience living, having experience with someone living with HIV. But um, I think it's really important for us as a community to also be aware of the, the different parties that are involved in the different interests and how they operate and how they're incentivized um, mm -hmm. in a way that will end up helping us in the long run. So it's, it's, yeah. it's important to talk about it. It's important to be aware of and have that transparency. Um, but I, I do want to ask with the ask for, for the audience, for the viewers, for people you know, affected by this, why are you asking now? Well, I'm asking now because I feel that the current conditions with the bad, you know, sort of market in 2023 with the, uh, you know, Wall Street sort of letting us down a little bit on this SPAC idea with, um, uh, you know, uh, the delays that that's caused. I feel very anxious about putting pedal to metal on the next study. You know, I just feel and, and hopefully you feel this way, too. People are suffering. People are even dying. And, um, you know, so when we do this makes a big difference. And sitting here without uh, having sufficient capital to, to go full speed on the next study is very, very frustrating. And so I, I believe that, you know, small donations from a very large community. I mean, think about this, that there's 1.2 million people in the United States who are living with HIV. If each one of them were to give 20 bucks, that's more than the cost of the clinical study. Now, I don't think that they even all have 20 bucks. Okay. So I don't expect that to happen, but you could see that, you know, there's power in numbers that can make a big difference. And they're not the only people who care about HIV, right? They have friends and family and they have a whole community of folks actually who have witnessed the AIDS epidemic, who have witnessed the, you know, the, the carnage really that HIV has wreaked on the world and that have a deep desire to see that change. And I'm thinking especially about the LBGTQ community. I think that they have a lot of empathy for people that are living with HIV. And I think that um, well, that's another, I don't know how many people that is in the United States, but I would imagine that it's got to be 20 million or more. And so, you know, I'm hoping that people that are listening to 
your podcast would go to the donation link, which I, I'm, hopefully you'll just put down in the description there or go to our website and hit the donate button and, um, you know, donate what they can, what, what, what they can, you know, maybe on behalf of somebody else who can't donate, uh, maybe in memory of somebody that they lost, uh, you know, if they can spare a small amount of money, maybe the kind of money they would normally give to a politician, maybe skip giving money to a politician for a month and give it to, you know, an HIV project. Uh, this would make a huge difference in something that we really care about. And I promise you it will be uh, directed entirely at that mission, nothing else. And I promise you that you, you are helping to bring the resources to a passionate group of people that really see, uh, you know, um, ending uh, HIV in our lifetimes as potentially being our legacy. We're really motivated. So, um, yeah, that's, that's uh, what I'd love to see happen. A politician, no love lost there. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, you know, I get um, fundraising things from politicians like at least ten times a day, and I think and text yeah, messages you know, and voicemails and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I really want you to, because we talked about this offline. But I, I would love for you to share a little bit about your personal investment. Like you're not just some guy who's running a company with no personal stake. You know, if the company goes belly up, you walk away and you do something else. This is really personal for you. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. You know, I'm not sure that everybody knows my backstory, but um, at age 42, I retired uh, from Silicon Valley because I had been successful at a whole series of startups and at Apple and um, buying and selling houses and trading in internet stocks. And, you know, I got out before the the, the bubble burst on a lot of different things. And so at age 42, I realized I have enough money that I don't need to work anymore. And so I bought a house in Hawaii and I retired. And then I got married and between vacationing all the time and being married, that was really interesting for about five years. And then I just felt like my mind was turning to mush. I needed something, you know, to work on. I needed a purpose. And as chance would have it, I met Roscoe Brady, who showed me viral vectors, and he was an accomplished drug developer at NIH. Viral vectors are essentially you can crack open viruses and use them to deliver new DNA to living cells in, you know, fully formed human beings. It's sort of like he was showing the, you know, the diskette for the human cell that we could deliver new software to the human cell. And, that, and, and you know, your DNA drives everything in your body. And I just saw this future of amazing stuff we can do from curing cancer to everything else. And so then that became my purpose. I just got so excited about it. I had this vision, this epiphany. And uh, so I sold the house and I used that to fund uh, the uh, start of this company. And I worked at it for 10 years for no money, just putting money in myself the whole time. And then uh, eventually we got some started getting some investors and um, the market sort of caught on to the idea of gene and cell therapy. But through this time period, um, I and my family have put in, uh, you know, a very big portion of our entire net worth. I mean, I risked my entire retirement. I risked my wife's retirement, you know, all those things. So this is more than, you know, just sort of, a, uh, you know, like a, a, a folly for me. This is, a, you know, something that I'm, I am, I believe in. You know, that's what keeps me going. We keep on, you know, when when you feel almost like, oh, can I still go on with all of the demands on raising money and bridging a payroll for my own pocket or, you know, whatever, uh, is it worth doing? We get another result that tells me that we're on track to get to something really important that, you know, if if I could, you know, be part of a team that ends something like this, right? I mean, this would be almost as big as, or bigger maybe than the cure for polio, right? This would be something that, you know, would, I would have made a difference in the world. And so, you know, I just jump out of bed every Monday morning after working all weekend. And, you know, so that's my personal story. I'm all in. My wife is retired. She travels. I see her whenever she misses me enough to come back to Maryland. This is not her favorite place to live. 
Uh, but for me, it's a great place to have a company like this and to work. And so um, we have a great marriage. We, you know, put up with each other. She puts up with me working and I put up with her being away all the time and entertaining herself. And so it's not a bad, I don't mean that as a bad thing, but man, I am really, you know, focused on this thing. And, and, and that's my story. Fantastic. And so why are you asking, asking now, as opposed to from the, the beginning? Well, um, this is my personal feeling about it. Um, now I didn't know anybody with HIV, at least nobody had told me that they had HIV before I got into this, but I've met a ton of people who have HIV, who are living with HIV right now. Right. And, um, and they are, you know, all, all of them desire freedom from that. Okay. But there's also this feeling amongst a lot of them of almost desperation. And one of the things that I've, I've learned in life is that the desperate frequently are taken advantage of. And I think that there may be some situations, even in the HIV community, you know, they're being served by these, uh, you know, for-profit companies. And, you know, they may sometimes feel like, do these companies really, you know, represent them, care for them? Are they doing the best that they can? There are some, sometimes examples where you can tell that they're definitely not doing that. So that's very discouraging. But I understand, you know, that there's this, it's a, a situation where, you know, you, people in that, it, it, that are living with HIV don't have a, a choice. The choice is, is to progress to AIDS or take the meds, Right. And so it's a powerless position and, um, and I didn't want to go out there selling hope to folks that were likely to buy hope, right? I really felt like I might be taking advantage of them. The situation has changed now with all the data that we've gathered in the phase one and the analytic treatment interruption. And I feel like I have the confidence uh, in myself that I'm willing to say, look, I really believe that we're on the right track here and that this is worth supporting. And that, yes, I'm still selling hope in a way, but I'm bringing data too. And so I feel comfortable now going out and asking for this assistance. And I think it would be the right thing for people to do. I don't want them to take money out of their pocket that they need to live, no way. But if people have some spare money that they can toss at this, OK, they can make a difference in something that they care about and and we will work diligently and passionately and and we have every incentive to see this through to the very end. You know, it's not just that we want to be those folks that uh, that, uh, you know, finally put HIV in the rearview mirror with a cure or, you know, better and better treatments. Um, it's. It's that we really can't even deliver on the idea of a corporation for all those people who invested in us unless we do that. So you cannot have any more, more motivation than this. We cannot rest on our laurels. We must keep going. And I think that there's a lot of compatibility between the, uh, the, the, the community of people that are living with HIV, advocacy, um, the LBGTQ community, the family and friends of these folks, and, and humanists anywhere who understand that HIV is not gone, it is not cured, it is still uh, a burden on so many of our fellow citizens. 1.2 million Americans are living with HIV. That is, that is more than one in 300. We pass them every day on the street. We work with them. We travel with them, okay? They, um, you know, are our friends, our family, our neighbors, our colleagues, um, our politicians, <laughs> our business people, right? Okay, you know, if you care about other human beings, uh, this is a great project. You know, skip a cup of coffee and, and, uh, and, and donate, uh, you know, something to potentially curing HIV. And so that's the reason I waited is I, I think it's reasonable now. And, and, and I think people should decide for themselves. Don't take my word for it. You know, there's a lot of information on the websites and, and those articles, right? There's the data. That's the, I'm bringing the receipts and uh, you know, it's, it's up to uh, the public to decide, okay, is, is this, you know, uh, you know, real enough that they're ready to engage.
Yeah. And I want to be clear too, for my own sake, I'm not, I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. I am a fan of the research that they're doing. It sounds hopeful. And I wanted to give Jeff the opportunity to come on and share with you and give you the opportunity, like you said, to decide for yourself, look at the data, look at the links below that I'll have available for you. And if it's, if it's for you, great. If you can't, that's okay. Um, but you can also share this with your loved ones, with friends, who other people who would might be interested in, in doing so. Um, but I'm certainly not telling you or instructing you what you have to do with yourselves and your your financial situation. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, and yeah, go ahead. No, I, I I think you know that's exactly it. Is like you know, look, the great thing about human beings is that we can talk about concepts with one another. We can engage not just in terms of descriptions of the physical universe, but it, the ideas, uh, you know, sort of abstract ideas like caring and empathy and love. And, um, and I, I think that it's our communication skills, number one, that make us a great species. And then it's our ability to collaborate that allows us to move mountains. Curing HIV is a huge undertaking. Everybody told me I was crazy when I started it and they were right. But sometimes, you know, it's the crazy people that change the world. And again, you know, if you've been, you know, you've been, uh, had a lot of conversations with me and you've seen the progress, you know, and I really appreciate how you've tracked uh, the project and, and how you brought more attention to it. And, um, you know, and I think together we've, we've also uh, done some things to reduce stigma and to increase understanding of HIV and, uh, and the community. And so, um, you know, th these collaborations are really valuable. I would love to engage everybody in a collaboration uh, in this next clinical trial. And what I'll do is, you know, anytime you want, uh, Raif, you know, call me up and I will give everybody a status report on exactly what we're doing. And I would also love it if you put my LinkedIn profile down there and people would just follow me because we're just now putting out every time we have news, we put it in my LinkedIn profile. And, um, you know, it's a great way to just keep track of what we're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the video I did on your announcement of AG AGT 103T, as well as the interview with you and then the interview with Dr. Marcus Conant, the chief medical officer at AGT, um, all together has, I, I want to say between 450 to 500,000 views. So certainly wow. it's had an impact on the community. Oh my gosh, that's, that is terrific. I mean, congratulations yeah. to you, Raif. I mean, and to the community, I also got to say that, you know, you bring across a very rational and educated perspective on uh, HIV, living with HIV, and just, you know, lessons of life. Um, and uh, all our conversations have always been fun uh, for me and meaningful. And so obviously that's resonating with people out there. So wow, 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 wow. And hey, let me encourage people to go ahead and whether or not you're going to uh, donate, share this video with your friends and family, and let's get more people on this channel, you know, tracking what's going on, learning about HIV, and this is going to create more and more momentum to cure HIV and to rid the world of HIV and to just make the, you know, send this to the dustbin of history. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for coming on and talking so openly about your research and the opportunity for folks at the home to help, uh, folks at home to help contribute. Um, I, we're all wishing you the best of luck. We're rooting for you. Uh, we're all rooting for you when you need it. So <laughs> you can continue your potentially life-saving work. Thank you, Raif. Uh, thank you so much for having me back again. And I can't wait till the next time we talk. Everyone at home, thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you get a notification every time a new video comes out. And please share this video with anyone in your life who you might think might find value in this content. Again, all links, info, all that stuff is going to be in the description box below, so be sure to check it out. Until next time, cheers.